Well, um, it's been a long time. It was February 2019 that I first sat here in my thinking chair and um, started talking to you about the project. Um, and it's now September uh, 2021. Um, that's two years, seven months. And uh, of course, there were some years before that of learning about medieval buildings and, 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 and living this project sort of form in my in my head um, it's going to be uh, exhibited um, next month um, in uh, the floor one gallery rugby art gallery and museum it's part of the alchemy exhibition and um, I'm, I'm just thinking at the moment it's been it's been a long time um, the world has changed since February 2019 I had a little dog um, the world uh, had not heard of COVID-19 uh, so it's been tough um, but um, I, uh, I pushed on with it anyway, and it is now finished. This is the final video. What I'm gonna do is uh, show you a brief couple of fly pasts that I um, shot last night. Um, and then I'm going to read to you the story of the sign of the silent woman. Um, I'm still saying that, it's quiet woman. Um, you'd think I'd know what it's called by now probably addled my brain quite a lot. The Sign of the Quiet Woman. In the city of Stanos in Verdith, on the corner of Grubnut Street and Goblin Gate, there is now an enormous crater. Where the crater now is, once stood the tower of the Archmage once was, until the day that it didn't. On that day, the wizard, for reasons nobody would ever ask him, decided to elevate his home into the air and begin its seemingly random voyaging over the lands between Lardalia and the Great Escarpment. There's a footnote on nobody would ever ask him, which is footnote one, except perhaps for Will Quince the pot gnome. Will would ask him, but Will has been turned into a toad more than once before and is now kept mostly in the kitchen for the sake of his own safety. This would have been merely remarkable and perhaps would have caused no more than a little sad nostalgia from the citizens, were it not for the fact that he decided to take the adjacent inn and hostelry with him. Thus, the sign of the quiet woman, along with almost all those present on that fateful day, now floats across the landscape, occasionally stopping to sojourn above various settlements. The removal of one of the largest buildings in the city, its occupants and an enormous lump of the bedrock on which it stood, was, it must be admitted, a somewhat illiberal act. But who argues with an archmage? Footnote 2. Footnote 2 reads, except perhaps for Will, Quince, the pot gnome, etc, etc. Those remaining in Stanos are still angry about the enormous crater and the loss of a much frequented entertainment and refreshment venue. 
None, however, were as angry as Benedict Robottom, draper of Grubnut Street, and Mistress Isolda Wedgmore, the dowager of Goblin Gate, who lost their party walls in the upheaval. The very literal upheaval. The following description begins with the lowest level, the ground, and works its way up. The ground, if it can still be called that when floating in the air. The tower was once built magically on a fine foundation of drulitic red, red sandstone by once was. The inn, mundanely, under the project management team of Timothy the Treacherous and Trevor the Trusty. The latter strangely disappeared by an early in an early phase of the construction and has never returned to claim his share of the profits. The septic tank, once a marvel of urban sanitary engineering, now overflows directly into the air and is especially resented by any householder who happens to be underneath when the quiet woman settles over a population centre. It is fed by the sluice chute, which serves all floors. It is not a guardrobe, this is not a castle, and there's nothing wrong with a good old chamber pot, you know. It discharges into the tank by way of an open drain, unfortunately close to the kitchen door. The oozing drain is crossed by a famously rickety plank. Residents often speculate on why that famously rickety plank doesn't get fixed, but it's always somebody else's job. Somebody's going to have a nasty slip one of these days. The dungeon steps once led to opportunity and danger deep below the surface of the world. Many an adventurer descended, never again to return. Or maybe it was just an old beer cellar. The yard. A farmer by the name of Hubert Cheapskate had travelled to Stanos on the day of the great upheaval and, having sold his load of turnips, took his mule to the farriers ostensibly with the intention of stopping in for a drink before he went home. He mistimed his return and now has no cart. Serves him right. Parking is for patrons only. The midden is a right old dump. A bucket and a large tub are situate in the yard. Al fresco bathing is popular, especially when the quiet woman floats to the warmer climes of Saldith in the far south. The Ginnel. This passageway was once a useful pedestrian thoroughfare in Stanos, shortcutting from Grubnut Street to Old Mother Squirtwurzel's exotic pet shop. Now it leads from nowhere in particular to nowhere in particular, but it's still cool, and Ginnel is a very cool word. The ground floor. The tavern consists of the common room, the tap room, and a significant number of nooks. Rumour has it that the number of nooks can vary. Some put this down to dimensional magic, but is more likely to be the result of inebriation. Here also is the kitchen from which many an eldritch horror has emerged, usually on a trencher. And the private quarters of Prudence Penny, the indomitable landlady of the quiet woman. She enjoyed the irony of the fact that no woman was ever less quiet than she when it came to the removal of customers overstaying their welcome at chucking out time on a good Saturday night. Now the tap room is quieter and she is in a protracted negotiation with Wizard Once Was with regards to furlough payments for her staff. Even when the inn comes to rest over settlements, Visitors' numbers can be limited by their degree of liking for the climb of a 50-foot rope ladder. The secret room was accessed only by climbing two flights of confusingly situated stairs, then descending two flights of bizarrely situated stairs. As a result, few found their way into the secret room, except by mistake. I should like to tell you what was in the secret room, but then it wouldn't be. Footnote three. Footnote three reads, Will Quince presumably knows, but the dungeon steps must descend from there, and that idle pot gnome has been seen sitting on the bottom step, bombing people below with overcooked Brussels sprouts. The first floor. This floor is in the inn proper, comprising a number of rooms, 
uh, in which the weary may lay their heads. If they're well behaved and able to pay in gold up front, stresses Prudence Penny. Five of the rooms are occupied by long-term residents. They are Simeon Spanks, an ex-paladin from Irillion, whose commitment to party discipline exceeded even medieval notions of personal space respect. Spanking your work colleagues rarely goes down very well and is now frowned upon in most corporate policy documents. Matilda, dragon rider of Boon, whose self-selected cognomen turned out to be a career-long disappointment. Petal the Angry, the only dragon she ever met, turning out to be very angry indeed, even for an ancient red, and not at all amenable to being ridden. Matilda is bathed thrice daily in calamine lotion. Tallulah the Cat Burglar, who first came to the quiet woman by an irregular route and in an, and in an official capacity, decided that she liked it and promptly went straight. Well, mostly. Nagor Skullcracker, who after a long and distinguished career has reinvented himself as a half-orc lepidopterist. And Terence the Tedious, a chartered accountant from somewhere or other who believes that something called fine art is real. The upper dragon beam supports the sign of the quiet woman itself. The name is not original. The traditional image of a headless matron is here replaced by a headless medusa or gorgon. Nobody could object to a headless medusa, could they? Well, yes, they could. According to some, she's just a misunderstood female, misrepresented by the patriarchy. But having a wizard for a friend means never having to say you're sorry. A bit like being an artist. Some claim that the figure is not carved, but actually a real Medusa, which Wizard once was turned into wood as an act of poetic justice. He's not telling. And a quotation from The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. I shall see about that, said Mrs. Yeobright, and they turned towards the inn, known in the neighbourhood as the Quiet Woman, the sign of which represented the figure of a matron carrying her head under her arm, beneath which gruesome design was the written couplet so well known to frequenters of the inn. Since the woman's quiet, let no man breed a riot. The inn which really bore this sign and legend stood some miles to the northwest of the present scene, wherein the house more immediately referred to is now no longer an inn and the surroundings are much changed. 1912. The second floor. The second floor is principally occupied by the beautiful ladies of negotiable virtue, whose artistic skills are legendary from the frozen wastes of Histicit, where the lizard men dwell, to the gin-ridden desert sands of Gadakra. When the inn stood in Stanos, gentlemen callers were obliged to gain admittance by the lower floors, emerge onto the balcony by the ironclad door on Grubnot Street, and follow its length past the ever-present anachronistic but beautiful lingerie on the washing line to the very fancy door on Goblin Gate. Thus their destination was often apparent to any good citizen who should happen to glance up. That consideration didn't seem to stop them. Visitors to these chambers are fewer these days, but once was seized to it personally that the ladies are well compensated and their appreciations of him are never lacking. Hence the saying, Wizards get all the girls, a saying which he probably made up himself. The third floor. The treasury of the wizard takes up most of the space of these rooms. You can't have a distinguished adventuring career and slay four dragons, two whites, one green and a red, without accruing a significant hoard yourself. And what can you do with it? He could give it away, of course. But such a seemingly beneficial act, he argues, would have, uh, would have unforeseen consequences, such as causing soaring inflation. A floating inn and a wizard's tower is quite enough without other things going up, thank you. And besides, he's a believer in the principle that the wealth trickles down. 
And indeed, sometimes it does. The odd copper piece or two working its way through the aged floor floorboards should the quiet woman ever meet a little aerial turbulence. Water and supplies are taken in by the winch which now uh, and now precarious loading platform on the third floor. Formerly by the half orc twins, Nucky the Lucky and Nucky the Unlucky. These days, Nucky the Lucky is a warehouseman alone. It's funny how the gods just know. The attics. Hotel servants and sometimes the most low paying visitors sleep here. Nucky the Lucky now has a generously sized room and Fred the Tap Boy has one somewhere. The only guest here at present is Grengo the Plastered, dung shoveler to Matilda, dragon rider of Pugn. He has no dung to shovel these days, so his work only involves filling bathtubs with calamine lotion. He spends a lot of time on the ground floor. In one of the gable ends, you can see the dove cut. Doves are not kept for romantic reasons. The squabs, chicks, are ground up in a big pestle and mortar to make a sort of pâté. This is history, not fantasy. The former often proving more disgusting than the latter. A certain unpleasant pot gnome is always the first to volunteer for this vile task. The spectral remains of one pewter Phyllis are sometimes to be encountered in the dusty corridors beneath the thatch. She has been known to dance with Fred the Tap Boy and is often, ha often heard laughing through the night. This, is some this sometimes annoying spirit is most usually, usually known as the gay grey lady. The chimney. It's cool, isn't it? Well, not literally. It's actually rather warm. It's a chimney. The cottage. Wizard once was his father, Archmage Quondam was, after 259 years, has reached the stage of life where he needs a little care and supervision. The metamorphosing of all the villagers of Little Muckby into Wallabies may have had something to do with once was his decision to tell him that he couldn't live alone anymore. Quandam was refused to leave his beloved crock-framed crock cottage, so once was teleported it onto the roof of the quiet woman. It might also be that the artist has become a timber-framed building's anorak and desperately wanted to include an example of a crock-framed construction somewhere, somehow. The tower. Once was lives in a tower. Wizards do that. Nobody knows what lies within. There is a footnote, footnote four. Not even Will Quince the pot gnome. He says he does, but this time he's lying. Nobody knows what lies within. Grib the homunculus ought to know, one would think, but the wizard purposely constructed him without a memory, so he must explore its wonders afresh every time he comes and goes. Well, presumably there are wonders, but he can't remember. In the highest room, of course, once was studies the stars through his invisible telescope and uses the information thus garnered to develop his latest project, which is something to do with the transmogrification of several animated tea towels into a flock of seagulls. He managed it the other way round once, and they've been annoying him ever since. The tower's pinnacle is topped by a lead statue of the famous Marco Gnome of Marco Gnome's messenger surface. He is here presented as a rather young gnome as he was when once was first befriended him. At certain times, when the infinitely less distinguished pot gnome can be seen sitting at the bottom of the dungeon steps doing despicable things with old Brussels sprouts. The entire edifice, therefore, has a gnome at the very top and a gnome at the very bottom. Ridiculous, but true. I should like to tell you much more about said Marco, who is represented in effigy here, but that is another story. Can you spot the skeleton of Trevor the Trusty, some potsherds, a weird fish skeleton, an apple core, Benedict Robottom's favourite cloak, the barred and shuttered window of the treasury damaged by Tallulah the cat burglar's arrival, 
the fancy front door of the inn, the plainer back door of the inn with its rickety plank over the overflowing drain, the dragon beam, the ironclad door to the balcony, the fancy door from the balcony, wizard once was his secret entrance to the stew, a beautiful door painted in scooter red, arch pages, quondam was his preferred mode of transport, and the invisible telescope. That's it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Please subscribe, like, comment, share. Thanks for listening.